Here we'll learn about ovarian cysts and tumors, which are often referred to as adnexal masses. The adnexa refers to structures next to the uterus, including the uterine tubes and ovaries. Approximately 20% of women will develop at least one ovarian cyst in their lifetime, and approximately 1 in 72 will develop ovarian cancer. To begin, start a table and denote that ovarian cysts are sacs of fluid that form within or on the ovaries. They can be simple or complex. Functional cysts, including follicular and corpus luteal cysts, are produced by normal events in the menstrual cycle. Denote that ovarian cysts are usually asymptomatic, incidental findings, but they can cause pain and or hemorrhage in cases of rupture or torsion. Malignancy is unusual, but denote that the risk is higher in postmenopausal people. Be aware that children can also have ovarian cysts, which often spontaneously resolve. Next, denote that ovarian cancer is a leading cause of cancer deaths, partly because it's often diagnosed in advanced stages with poor prognosis. Primary ovarian cancer can originate from cells in the ovaries, uterine tubes, or peritoneum. To note that signs and symptoms of ovarian cysts and tumors overlap and include abnormal uterine bleeding, pain or pressure in the pelvic area, back and abdomen, often pain during intercourse, nausea, bloating, and changes in urination or defecation. Larger adnexal masses can produce feelings of bloating and stomach fullness, which can lead to weight loss. In diagnosing ovarian cysts and tumors, we can use ultrasound to determine the size and location. Note that it's important to rule out pregnancy, urinary tract infection, and pelvic inflammatory disease, which can cause similar symptomatology. In some ovarian cancers, tumor markers can be helpful. We include information on ovarian tumor markers in our notes. Risk of cyst and tumor development increases with age, endometriosis, certain genetic mutations, and the lifetime number of ovulatory cycles. The lifetime number of ovulatory cycles is determined by age at menarche and menopause, parity, lactation, and use of hormonal contraceptives that block ovulation. Thus, protective effects are conferred by factors that reduce the number of lifetime ovulations. Later menarche, earlier menopause, higher parity, lactational amenorrhea, and use of hormonal contraceptives. Now let's turn our attention to specific types of ovarian cysts and tumors. Begin with ovarian cysts and show that when the ovarian follicle doesn't rupture and release the egg, a follicular cyst forms around the trapped egg. Show that when the corpus luteum doesn't dissolve after ovulation, it becomes a corpus luteal cyst. These cysts are the most common masses found in the first trimester of pregnancy and usually regress postpartum. Show that theca lutein cysts are the result of human chorionic gonadotrophin, HCG, excess or hypersensitivity. They form most often during pregnancy or infertility treatments. Recall that HCG is produced by the early placenta. When excess HCG stimulates the nearby ovaries, it triggers the formation of multiple, often bilateral, cysts. In our notes, we include information on gestational trophoblastic disease, which is also characterized by tumors formed in pregnancy. Lastly, indicate that endometriomas comprise estrogen-dependent ectopic endometrial stroma, glands, fibrous tissue, and blood. The dark, tarry blood gives them the dark, brownish color that lends them the nickname chocolate cysts. Be aware that endometriomas can also be found elsewhere in the body and require yearly follow-ups. To treat and prevent ovarian cysts, we can use hormonal contraceptives which block ovulation. However, cysts with the following characteristics warrant further evaluation. Greater than 10 centimeters in diameter, complex architecture with solid components, thicker septa, ascites, and increased vascularity. Removal of the ovaries recommended if malignancy suspected or if the mass is persistent, painful, or if there's risk of torsion, which can lead to ischemia and ovarian necrosis. Now let's learn about ovarian tumors. Show that they're classified according to their cell type of origin. Epithelial cells on the surface of the ovary, germ cells, oocytes, or stromal cells, which includes the ovarian stroma, thecal cells, and granulosa cells. Each category has several subtypes. We'll start with the epithelial tumors, which includes carcinomas and cyst adenomas. Indicate that key carcinomas include high-grade serous carcinoma, which is 
the most lethal and most common form, more than 70% of ovarian cancers are high-grade serous carcinoma. High-grade serous carcinoma often originates from epithelial cells in the uterine tubes. They're often bilateral with both cystic and solid components. Endometrioid carcinoma is the second most common ovarian cancer, accounting for approximately 10% of cases. It's usually low-grade with good prognosis, show that these tumors are thought to arise from transformed endometrial tissues and are associated with endometriosis and Lynch syndrome. They indicate that rarer ovarian carcinomas include mucinous carcinoma, which is often the result of metastasis from gastrointestinal tumors, and clear cell carcinoma, which is associated with endometriosis. Next, indicate that cyst adenomas are common, benign, and large. Serous cyst adenomas are lined by cells that resemble uterine tube epithelium, whereas mucinous cyst adenomas are lined by mucus secreting cells that resemble gastrointestinal epithelium. Lastly, indicate that Brenner tumors are rare but can be malignant. They comprise transitional cells, sometimes called urothelial cells. Next, let's learn key germ cell tumors. Start with teratomas and indicate that mature teratomas, formerly called dermatoid cysts, are generally benign and comprise mature tissue from multiple germ cell layers. We show a tumor with hair, teeth, and other tissues. Immature teratomas are very rare but malignant. They comprise immature tissues and are more commonly found in patients under 20 years old. Tumor markers include elevated lactate dehydrogenase and indicate that dysgerminomas are malignant primitive germ cell tumors with variable histological patterns. They're most commonly found in children and young women. Tumor markers include elevated lactate dehydrogenase, LDH. Lastly, in this category, indicate that yolk sac tumors, also known as endodermal sinus tumors, are malignant and usually found in patients younger than 30 years old. They are soft, solid masses with a mucoid appearance. In histological samples, we may see Schiller-Duval bodies, which comprise central vessels surrounded by fibroid tissue and tumor cells. Patients may also have elevated alpha fetoprotein levels. Finally, indicate that key sex cord stromal tumors include fibromas, which are benign tumors comprised of fibroblasts, fecomas, which are benign tumors comprised of feca cells, and are often estrogenic. They're most commonly diagnosed in peri- or postmenopausal patients who present with uterine bleeding. Sertoli Leydig cell tumors are usually benign tumors with sex cord and stromal components that secrete androgens. And lastly, granulosa cell tumors, which are malignant tumors that often present with hyperestrogenism in adults or early puberty in children. Before we conclude, write that ovarian cancer is treated surgically and with chemotherapy. Unfortunately, recurrence is common in patients with advanced stage cancers. This concludes our diagram.